Hello, friends. Happy Friday. Welcome back to the Experts Channel in Angular Nation. And we have Ben Lesh in the house tonight. We're very excited. Well, it's evening here. It's uh, at, no, it's afternoon here. It's more. It's wherever you're at. Happy Friday. How are you doing, Ben? Good to see you. Good. I've got my morning cup of coffee. Yeah, so morning in Texas. So we, I asked right. you to come because you actually did a talk in London uh, that I was excited to see. I didn't get a chance to see it, and we were all excited to see it, but it wasn't recorded. So. Today we're recording it and we're going to do an encore and we're going to share it on YouTube. So we're excited. Uh, so, yeah. That's yeah. good. That's good. Everybody should see it. That's good. I'm, well, this is a, this is a talk that I, I'm excited about. Like, I don't think a ton of people have seen it. I've done it. Technically, I've done variations on it twice. And the second time there's supposed to be a lot of people and there was... There was a small, I think there might actually be more people here. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. It was fine. Though. The people that were there were, were lovely people. I, I had a good time. Yeah. I'm um, excited because we've had you right, here for me, a couple uh, of Q and A's and because we love to pick your brain and ask you lots and lots of questions. But I, I started to see a lot of repetition in the questions over time. And so I really wanted to see like, let Ben teach us what Ben thinks we need to know. And so I'm excited to have you come in and do a talk of your own choosing. So, okay, great. Because I'm going to jump in here and I'm going to basically talk about how a program <laughs> sucks. Is that cool? Tell us what you really think, Ben. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is. I mean, the, um, no, we don't have time for that. But we we can do what I have compressed into this talk. So I'm going to go ahead and present. Love it. And. While you do, I just want to give a quick shout out to AG Grid for hosting or for uh, sponsoring Angular Nation. We love AG Grid. Always say, say hi to AG Grid. You know, kind of fact, like I've I've had to do a lot of stuff with AG Grid over the last like three years. Do you love like them too? Like a, I I do. They're they're they're. It's a very very handy thing where you're like oh i need a really full feature table and i need it like now yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i don't want to build one yeah i love them so okay awaiting bugs All friday right. the 13th um, waiting bugs that's what we're doing we're awaiting bugs um i put friday the 13th on here just because i just like that it's friday the 13th because it's fun um, all right so i suppose most y'all know that I am Ben Lush and I'm that ArcGIS guy. Uh, I gave this talk at a, well, it wasn't an Angular crowd, right? So uh, I had to introduce myself. Uh, there's fewer people in the audience that were familiar with uh, with ArcGIS. Uh, this talk is actually not specifically about ArcGIS, but um, as to describe it, if I will just pretend that a, a good chunk of the Angular people here don't know what ArcGIS is. <laughs> Um, it's this library you can find it on GitHub. Uh, it's up to more more than 40 million weekly downloads now, which is relatively insane. It's like one of the more downloaded things on um, NPM. Uh, it exists in things like the PlayStation. If you go there and you look through your PlayStation credits, you'll see the the uh, R S license in there. Uh, it's in YouTube. Some of the YouTube apps use it. Um, Netflix used it for a while. I don't know if they're still using it or not. Um, there's, it's used in a lot of places. Slack, your desktop client for Slack has RCS in it and so on. All right, so RCS is Lodash for async. I think most of you all know that. People that might be watching the recording don't really know that. It's a bunch of utility functions for dealing with asynchronous things or sets of asynchronous things. Uh, but I actually don't want to talk about RCS today. What I really want to talk about is asynchronous programming and what async really is. So, um, what, what asynchronous programming is, if you look at the definitions, they're kind of like the, like it's uh, not existing or occurring at the same time. That's close. Uh, I like this controlling the timing operations by the use of pulses sent when the previous operation is completed rather than, so vaguely, yeah, but basically there's an astronomy one in here. Like none of these definitions are very great to describe asynchronous programming, especially in JavaScript. Um, so in JavaScript, async really generally means different events in the event loop. So, you know, that's not 
exactly what async always means. It could just mean that you go through, you call a function it, and move on. And in the same event, in the event loop, whatever body of that function gets called because you did some queuing or some weird stuff. We're not going to get into that. Uh, for purposes of this talk, we're talking about different events on the event loop. And what the event loop is, is this crude, <laughs> this is this is an oversimplified crude mapping of what an event loop is. You've got this thing where it's like, there's a loop and it's pulling, there's a stack of events that need to be processed, a stack of code that needs to be executed. Each bit in the stack doesn't know anything else about anything, any of the rest of the stack. And you're just pulling them off in a uh, first in, first out sort of way and executing them. And then you, as soon as that one's done, you move to the next one. As soon as that one's done, you move to the next one. That way you can use a single thread to its fullest and do these asynchronous thing. You don't have to block anything to, to get this done. Um, so you, as you do user inter interactions or things come back from uh, Ajax requests or whatever, uh, it will go onto this event queue or like a timer fires, it'll go into this event queue and it eventually it'll be executed. You get into promises and things like microtasks, it gets a little bit more complicated than this diagram, but for all intents and purposes, this is basically how it works. All right. So completely synchronous code, which is not asynchronous, it is synchronous, will be executed in a single event. So if I have my do something sync uh, function here, the entire body that's highlighted there is going to be executed in a single event in my event queue and my event loop. But as soon as we do anything asynchronous, so here I've got something that returns a promise, uh, it's actually going to be two events or maybe more, but in this case, two events. So I've got, uh, a, I call do something async. It executes everything in yellow first, with above and below there, and then it will queue up the blue bit to be fired after that at some point, whenever get value resolves the prompts. Um, all right, so that doesn't seem so bad. Why is async programming hard? All right, so asynchrony adds unknown. So let's look at our do something sync function here. You have that get value. And because we live in a world where there's asynchronous things that can happen, if I don't know what get value does, it could have some weird side effect. It could do something asynchronous. There's no, there's no cue there. Like, I mean, a good developer would make a get value function that got value synchronously and didn't have any side effects, but there's no guarantee that whoever wrote get value is, knows what they're doing. I mean, in this case, I wrote it. I might be messing with you. So, uh, get value could be going off and doing something wildly asynchronous. You cannot, you have no guarantees in a language that allows asynchrony, which is pretty much all of them, that you know exactly what's happening all the time. So it adds another dimension, it adds another uh, dimension to readability problems too, right? Um, so the code flow and generally when you're looking at stuff is top to bottom, left to right, just like you would read, uh, unless you're reading an Arabic language in which case it goes the other direction. but. Uh, top to bottom, left to right. Um, and so you can kind of look at things and dependably know like what's going to happen. But asynchrony kind of adds this sort of like side quest thing. So you've got this body of a function that you can normally read top to bottom, left to right. And then there's a bit in there where you have to look and say, oh, I know in my head because I've learned how to program that this is going to do something asynchronous. Based off of this, in this case, we've got this queue that you can see we're using, we've got a callback in there um, and it's for a promise. So we definitely know it's asynchronous. Even if there's a callback, you don't know if it's asyn asynchronous or synchronous, right? So, um, but it was, in this case, we have Q and we know that uh, in this case, at least we have this nice uh, function that kind of clearly shows that there's a separate event body that's going somewhere, right? So before, you know, we're having thing highlighted yellow and blue, you can look and be like, oh, there's a definite, line between like what's executed in one event and what's executed on another event. Um, async await actually takes that nice function body away, but it makes things look a little cleaner. You can, you can now read things top to bottom, left to right, which is good. Uh, but you don't really have a cue to know like what part of it is a different event on a different event loop. I mean, you do, you should know that where there's the, the await, like everything like on the left side and down from the await are all things that, but it's not, it, it's been kind of hidden from you. Not, not like it was with regular function calls.
So, uh, yeah, async interactions at uh, async interactions at. I think I meant at. Wow, that's that's great, Ben. I've given this talk twice now, and that typo's been in there. We see nothing. Um, we love you, Ben. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, add another dimension to how we need to think about code, and the and this is just in in general code that you do not deeply understand is a, it, it's going to be a source of bugs. Like if you are, are working with code and you don't really understand what's going on, you're going to create bugs. There's no way around it. Like, cause you, if you don't deeply understand it, you're probably not going to test it very, very well. Um, or, you know, maybe not test it at all in some people's cases and you're going to make alterations to it and you don't really understand what those are doing. Like it's important to be able to deeply understand your code and async makes it harder right like it does because you don't always know what it's doing uh in between bits that you are, are under your control so these sorts of bugs though that um that come from it are usually in the sort of the the realm of leaked resources and concurrency bugs is the biggest thing that you get with async programming um <clears throat> the resources uh there's a variety of resources that can leak the there's a name this is non-comprehensive list but i mean it's vague enough to be kind of comprehensive you can leak you can leak memory you can leak cpu you can leak other things like uh you know handles to stuff for network connections or other types of io for like while you're reading files and such um and these can all happen um just based off the fact that you trigger something asynchronous maybe you didn't tear it down maybe you weren't able to stop it and so on so uh leaking uh so when you're talking about leaking memory you mean it's basically it's retaining objects uh in memory that you're no longer using uh cpu would be like executing stuff you don't need to execute anymore um and then the other stuff is just like you know accidentally leaving connections open or leaving observers watching something or you know whatever so concurrency bug though and this is the one that um I think most people have the worst time with because find it, sussing out a concurrency bug is a skill into itself. Uh, it usually involves logging and, and looking at a lot of stuff. Uh, so a concurrency bug is what is when things happen out of order. So here I've got this crude diagram where I'm sending the blue request to the server and you can see I'm sending a green request to the server and the green one comes back before the blue one does, right? So it's the the order that you thought you would see where it'd be like blue blue is back green green is back like that's not how it works like these things can happen and it could even shuffle that in some cases especially if you're working in a distributed system or a globally distributed system where like latency can vary wildly so all right this is my friend ken wheeler i love ken wheeler i mean uh, this tweet back uh what devrels are just three tribe examples in a trend coat in this case I'm the devil because I'm about to show you a contrived example. Um, so most of the time we write like nice, simple asynchronous code, something like this get user list thing and you call server API search. This is, so this is a really, really simple thing. It returns a promise. I think a lot of us have seen code like this at some point. Um, and then you wire it to some, uh, UI. Uh, and here I'm, I'm, React is the example I, I work most in React these days. No offense to Angular, Angular is great, but it's not that different. Uh, but so you wire it to some UI and you've got this thing like this when you're using React where it's like, oh, okay, uh, you handle the change when someone doesn't input change, and then you've got, they should probably debounce this to be honest, but we're not doing that. Um, the, the, every time the input changes, they're going in, they're fetching the filter, filter list and they're setting results, right? So this is fine. This is really simple code. Um, 99% of the time, this is probably going to work great. Maybe even five nines, this is going to work great. But if your system's distributed, you might have some problems, right? All right. So um, if we get some requirements from the business, this is what happens. Uh, they want it, the list sorted by purchase count. Okay. So you had a user's list. They want it sorted by purchase count. They want to know who the users are that are the highest purchasers in this list. Um, so you're an async wizard. This is no problem. Uh, we go through and we, we add some stuff here. So let's see, we've, we've changed our get user list to still go and get the filter list. We also go and get our purchase counts 
And then when we get these things back, we mesh them together and we sort them right. No problem. All right, so you update your UI code and everything is fine after that. So no big deal. So all you really had to do is add the purchase count there. Everything else is pretty straightforward. But there's actually two problems that come in. You get two JIRAs. JIRA number one, you're spamming the server, you stupid front end devs, right? You get this back end developer on your team um, who just loathes JavaScript engineers, right? Um, and you're just pummeling the server with way too many requests. Um, Okay. Uh, and then we have this other Jira that comes at the same time. Um, and this is coming from some user in accounting who is like, I get stale searches sometimes. They probably wouldn't even use the word stale. They're just like, the results are weird. And then you'd have to go figure out why the results are weird, right? So you know, I'm typing things. I'm typing and I see things that it shouldn't be. Sorry, that's the best I can describe it. That's that's a good bug from account, right? That's, that's, uh, that's what you'd expect to get from a non-technical user. So you got these two bugs. So here you are and you're like a quick little dash debounce later. And then you're, wait, you're in React. So you're like, oh wait, a quick search about how to get load, low dash debounce working with React hooks later. And you end up just doing it yourself because it's annoying. And here we go. So we got our set timeout in there and we're, we're keeping the reference to our timeout ID so we can clear the timeout the next time we're handling the change. Um, yeah, this is how you would have to do it in React, just FY, uh, Angular users. So here we are, uh, we have that, oh, wait, no, they've, hold on. They've got debounce hooks, which offend me deeply because then you're actually rendering things to do a debounce, but we'll, we'll set that aside. Um, so you've got this debounce implemented, super async programmer, you're doing great. Uh, both cheer is closed. You did awesome. You added this debounce and now you're sure that you've solved both things. You're not seeing weird results anymore. That was like, you've slowed things down. It's probably working all the time. Uh, but your user from accounting has come back and said, Hey, I'm still seeing sell stuff. Uh, are you sure you know what you're doing? Like they've got their doubts in your skills at what's going on. All right. So you comb through the logs because you're desperate to see what in the world's happening with this. And when in your logs, you're looking, it's like a bunch of gobbledygook and you're like, okay, so this is, this is concurrency debugging. This is, you're looking at logs. This is your life now. But then you realize, Hey, wait a second. I have this request request 23, uh, that goes out first with a, these are typed S M and then they type S C on the very next, like just to like, couple seconds later and the SC comes back, but then after that, the SM, the request 23 came back. So they came back out of order. That's pretty weird. Like I could see how that would cause a problem because then you realize, oh wait, your old request is coming back after the new request and rendering itself. That's a concurrency bug. So you're, you're like front end dev, you're like, all right, you, you see this problem and you're like, you know, this looks like a problem at the back end. Maybe the back end could respond in order. This is, this is a real thing that I've, I've witnessed happen. Uh, Hey, it looks like back end is returning requests before others. Can you fix that to the back end engineer and the back end engineer, we already know doesn't like the front end engineers. Um, and they're like, well, actually, actually, this is a, this is the nature of distributed systems. You can't just, and you get some big, long winded lecture and you tune it out. Uh, and or don't read the rest of it because it's in Slack. Um, JavaScript engineers should just be able to handle this. So you're not getting any help from the back end. So what do you do? All right. Here's what you do. You're like, right, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to use this abort signal thing that's built into the, the platform, not the language, the platform. Uh, and I'm going to be like, all right, so if I have the signal and it happens to be aborted, I'll check and you could do the same thing with just a, just a Boolean, by the way, like you could just have a Boolean in some cases. So I'm going to check this Boolean to see if it's, if it's been canceled and if, if it is, don't do anything else, just stop and so on and so forth. So you, you go through, you're able to cancel this and then our user search, we've added our port controller reference to the actual, um, component because we're going to need to keep a handle to it so we can tear it down. But. Like basically what we're going to try to do is make sure that, 
whenever we fire off the next request, we cancel the previous one because we don't want those results anymore, right? So everyone here that is familiar with ArcGIS, this is a switch map, effectively. This is just a hand-rolled switch map. Um, so you get all this in and you fixed it. But I'm going to go back to this real quick. Look how complicated this is now. Like before, it was just like, oh, I've got a function and I'm doing one simple thing, like the simple clean thing, the example that everyone used when they were like, hey, look, look at this async await or look at this promise in this new feature in the language. Look how easy it makes everything. And that's the, that's the example code. And this is now getting into more of a real world situation where you have actual concerns that come up that are reasonable and you have to deal with them. Um, all right. So it got complicated and it's still leaky resources, right? So you thought we fixed everything, but we did not. All right, here we go. So we have to hold on to that single instance until get all the users resolves, right? That's one. Uh, let's see if we make it a little farther. So if we make it past that point and we do our get purchase count, we have to wait until get purchase counts um, resolves. Actually, I'm sorry. This is search usernames, not get all users. More typos. Look at me. Very inefficient. Um, all right. And then uh, let's see what else is there. Oh, wait, wait. At this point, we already had the list of usernames too. Like we populated that in memory. So we also have to, we also have to clean that up. So that got retained until purchase that, that get all purchase counts resolved. Like, what if get all purchase counts takes like five seconds, 10 seconds or something. You did this a bunch of times. Like it's there. These are going to build up. Right. Uh, let's see, uh, that get all user that usernames allocated is there. Uh, what else? Same here, but we're now we also have the garbage collect purchase counts because they've been populated. Right. Like, uh, let's see part a small part of the leak is over here too. Because you you're also now executing code and getting to this point, it's allocated to promise. You get this users array back, which is going to be well, actually no, it's going to be undefined at this point. Uh, but you're still executing code. Um, all right. But like, so I was using this abort signal thing, and we had something, and like fetch. Everyone's like fetch. Then like it already supports abort signal. That's that solves your problem. Like it's going to you know, arrest the, all the other additional processing and everything. Not really, because now, now you have to anywhere you happen to be using fetch in your async stack or your async await stack, you now have to add this catch thing in there. That's like, Hey, if you give me this Dom exception, and it happens to be a board error. You can ignore it. Cause I knew about that. Right. So you're still executing code that you didn't really want to execute. Um, and that, that error type is like, in addition to all the other checks that we added, right? Like it's, it's not changing a whole ton. So the question becomes, why is it so easy to mess all this stuff up? I, I would think that'd be really readily apparent after I just went through all of the stuff that you had to do. Uh, it's because it's complicated. And why is it so complicated? It's just a byproduct of the tool we have available, right? Like this is, this is, uh, our language. Uh, has evolved to this point. And the, what I'm using here are just the native tools that you have in JavaScript. I'm not using anybody's libraries for anything. So the tools available in JavaScript back in just a history lesson here, back in 2014, uh, the tools we had are for synchronous things of one value, you had variable, you had your function return. So you call a function, you always get a single value back from it. And you always get that synchronous when you call the function. Um, even if that value you get back as a promise, but that's not in 2014, that's now. Uh, but you call a function, you synchronously get a value back, that's function return. A getter is a way to get a, a one value synchronously. Asynchronously, back then, the only way to get a single value back asynchronously was really a callback. Um, and then if you want many values, uh, back, back then, um, well, back in those days, they didn't, did they have iterables? I don't think they had iterables necessarily back then, but they had things you could iterate over like arrays. Uh, set and map didn't come until the following year, so that's incorrect. Generators again are the following year, so that's incorrect. But um, basically, you, you had arrays uh, effectively uh, or whatever constructs you could build out of, you know, cobble together. So the, the language had arrays for the most part. Now, um, 
One other problem back then though, is you could use callbacks to totally synchronous things. So oops, like you weren't really guaranteed when you saw a callback that it was going to be synchronous or asynchronous, or maybe both. And that caused problems. And so promises were born. And then, uh, 2015, they added promises and, <clears throat> excuse me, and promises solved this problem a little bit by always guaranteeing scheduling. So you could only use it for asynchronous values. You couldn't use it to do anything synchronous. Um, and that was a decision made because people were writing bad uh, callback based APIs. Um, all right. So, and then in 2018, they added async await and async iterables, right? So at this point, like async await was just, you know, kind of built off of promises as we know, async iterables are an iterator of promises effectively. So you, they took iterables and they took promises. They just kind of glued them together. So now we actually have a, another means like built into the language of having many asynchronous values over time. And again, this is an iterator of promises of iterator results, right? So you, you iterate to pull off a promise, you wait for it to resolve, then you look and see if it's done or you get a value. Um, so they've covered everything. And why would I, why would I think the tools are inadequate now if they've covered all of the corners of that little chart? Uh, all right. So just some async. 101, I want to talk about uh, producers and consumers. So a producer is whatever's producing values in your asynchronous code. And the consumer is whatever requested that the producer produce those things in the first place, right? So that's whoever wants those values. Uh, so the code that starts the observable, if you will, the, the code that starts the web socket, the code that, uh, you know, calls the function that returns the promise, that, that's, your, that's your consumer. All right. So the other thing is that all async actions like this have an outcome. Every single one of them has a small, a finite set of outcomes that could occur. Possible outcomes are it produces one or more values and then it's done. And that's the happy path. Uh, it produces no values and then it errors. A sad path. It produces no values and it's done. That's a different path, but it could happen uh, just depending on these things. It can't happen with a promise, right? But it can happen with, with other types like callback, whatever. Uh, produces one or more values and then it errors, right? right? So in the many values case, you could have that situation. Um, or maybe the consumer cancels at some point. Maybe it produces values, maybe it doesn't, but the consumer cancels, says, I'm no longer interested in your value producer. You can go ahead and shut down. And then you can also produce no values have it never be done and never air. So this is like your hung promise or the never observable or whatever you want to call it. The thing that just, it just, it's kind of a memory more than anything else, but it could happen. Or it produces one or more values and it's never done, never airs. And this isn't necessarily a memory leak. This could just be an open web socket, right? So these are all the different outcomes you can have. And promise only covers like two and a half of these. Okay, so you can produce one, you can produce one value and be done. You can produce no values and error, uh, or you could you could do the thing where it just hangs. You have a promise where you say new promise. You never call resolve or reject. Uh, let's see. Cancellation in particular is a big problem with promises. You cannot cancel a promise because they're eager. They don't give you a way to cancel necessarily. Like you can ignore their results, but you can't really cancel them. Uh, all right. So because async iterables build off of promises. It covers everything but the cancellation bit. You can kind of cancel. So because it's built off an iterator, iterators are canceled. And the way you cancel an iterator is you just don't next on it. So an async iterable is like almost cancelable in that you could be like, I'm not going to next on you and therefore I'm done. Um, but if you've nexted, you got a promise it's in flight. You can't cancel it. Like if you have to wait a long time for it, it's still going and you can't cancel. There's nothing, nothing you can do. So again, this is just what I said. Async iterable, you cannot, uh, you, you cannot iterate to cancel, but the promises still have to settle that, that are there in flight. And 
that's complicated, right? That's not, there's like two different ways to cancel. There's sometimes you can cancel it. Sometimes you can't. So in my head, like it's a useful type, but it's flawed in some ways. Like it's not, uh, it's not the ideal perfect. It's not a primitive anyways. It's, it's a more complicated type than uh say an observable or a promise or something. And again, this is because anything that's built on promises will never be cancelable. Never, ever. Like, never be cancelable. Like, I just want to, I just want to really st like stress this, especially after the addition of async await to the language, you cannot cancel. Like, what would you do with the rest of the body of your async function if like, like await this and then you're like, I canceled it. It's never going to resolve or reject. Then what? Everything hanging out in memory for your async function does what? Just chills in your memory forever or who knows what about whatever's waiting for that right so you, you can't cancel a promise uh like cancel it truly you have, you have to either resolve it or reject it which is why you have that um abort error uh rejection when you when you abort uh, uh fetch so in short <laughs> long story short as long as you're using promises, you're probably leaking resources. Like there's no way around it. Um, you're, you've got a promise in flight. If you decide you don't want it, you still have to wait for it to execute. There's no way around it because you can't cancel it. Anything with the, any async thing without cancellation, like real cancellation probably is, is leaking resources. But as a sanity check, that's probably okay. Like it's not the, the, the few nanoseconds of, of time that you're going to save, like canceling all the things they add up and some, but sometimes it's not okay. Like sometimes it, it legitimately is bad. Um, but you know, if, if all you're doing is writing that user search or whatever, and you, you incur some extra processing looping over, uh, an array once in a while or something it's, it's fine. As long as your app performs well enough for people to use and you can test your code, uh, and you understand it and can work on it. 100% great code. Good job. It's okay. All right. But what else is there out there? Uh, so this being, uh, an angular, uh, meetup, I think you know what else is out there, uh, observables. So I'm, I'm an observable shill. I'm here to tell you that observables are good. Uh, but I'm not here to sell RxJS to folks, uh, but observable tick all of these boxes. They can produce one or more values. They can produce no values. They can, uh, an error. They can produce no values and be done all everything. It's, it's totally 100% actually cancelable. Um, solves every single one of these async problems because it's primitive built for like every async scenario. So what is an observable? We'll go over it. Um, so if it, anyone that's done React development has probably seen something like this before, where like, and I showed an example of this earlier, where you've got your, you've got your use state up there, which is this thing where you can set state and it causes a re-render. Um, and you've got this use effect body and you use effect like whatever, whatever you've got in the, uh, the trailing array there is like dependencies and it says when this cha changes, whatever, if you've got nothing in there, it just mounts when the component mounts and unmounts. So in this case, there's nothing. And use effect has this body that it executes when the effect is, is, uh, calculated because your dependencies change or whatever, and it executes that body and it returns a teardown. And what's really crazy about this is you're like, okay, well, wait, 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 uh, maybe I want it wrapped in a custom hook. That's a real common practice. So they wrap a custom hook. I have one hook to call to do all this stuff. And then you're like, oh my God, what about error handling? So you add some stuff in there for your resource to handle the errors. Okay. So you know, got two different things and. This is for the funny thing about this is every time I see it, it's like, they've actually just made a weird react only observable. When they do this and just to illustrate it, I'm going to take this exact code and convert it to an observable. Oh, look, it's like less code and it's the same exact, code. like there's hardly any difference there. <laughs> it's pretty much the same code. Um, and this is what it is you, you define an observable and when you subscribe to it, it's going to execute the body of this thing and set up the resource and set up the events to push into the subscriber, which push out of the observable and you return some teardown that you, it's going to be fired whenever you unsubscribe or whenever it's complete or errors or something. All right. So 
It's a primitive like a promise. It can handle zero to end values. It handles the setup of event sources. It handles the tear down of those event sources when it needs to. Um, and it get, has guarantees around that. It provides a clean API for cancellation. It provides a clean API for handling errors. It's basically just a, a fancy function uh, more than anything else with a lot of safety features. Uh, so a lot of people, and I've talked about that this before on at this meetup, it, they conflate um, observables with RxJS, or they conflate um, observables with uh, the all the operators. And like the operators are not a requirement. Like observables are like the understanding what observable is when you see one is a requirement, right? And they're actually all over the place. So here's a bunch of libraries that all have their own observable implementations. They're not, they're not using an RxJS observable. So React Router, XState, and they're like, they're slightly different shapes. Some of them are exactly identical shapes. For example, uh, Relay and TRPC have exact clones of RxJS observable internally that they've cloned for various reasons, right? Um, but yeah, Svelte, Svelte is so close that you can use RxJS seamlessly with their implementation and it just works. I think I, I have a commit where I literally added one line of code to make sure it worked in there. Um, but yeah, they, all of these things, you notice I did list Angular in here because Angular uses RxJS, but like, clearly, if you look at this, everyone seems to land on the same primitive because it's primitive. Inevitably, you're going to land on it if you need something that does something like this. You're not going to land on async iterable, probably. That's more complicated. All right. So, in RxJS, just since its inception, uh, as of, what was it, last November, whenever I, I wrote this talk, has been downloaded uh, for... 4.7 billion times, right? That's just downloaded from NPM. That's not distributed to people's machines. That's not sent over the internet. Those numbers would be orders of magnitude higher than this. I have no idea what they would be, but they would definitely be orders of magnitude higher. So developers and CI and whatever has downloaded 4.7 billion times, just RxJS, not all those other libraries. You add those in there, it's gonna be much, much worse. Uh, Everyone here, I think, has probably heard of Slack or has used Slack for desktop. It's very, very popular. That's being, it's being used there. PlayStation, as I said before, it's being used there. Um, so the question becomes, what if Observable was just built into JavaScript? If it were just built into JavaScript, those 4.7 billion downloads would probably not exist. There would be fewer downloads because all people would need is, um, I had like a fly buzzing around in front of me. Um, all people would need it would just be from RxJS just be like the operator if they wanted them, right? Um, they, the, like the, these other libraries wouldn't have the code inside of them that are where they're defining observables. They would just use the native one. Um, if they're smart, if they're weird, they'd still build their own, but I would use the native one if there was one native. Um, and so, you know, there's a seven, I don't know if it's eight now, but seven, seven year old proposal that's been languishing at the TC39, not accepted, nope, but not rejected, no progress made. And it's just sitting there. And it's for the exact observable that you use in RxJS. Um, but Ben, I don't like RxJS. I don't want to use RxJS for observables. That's okay. Um, uh, you don't want to use all the operators and you don't want to pull in all of RxJS. It's free shakeable. It's fine. You don't need to pull all of it in. Um, but here's the thing you shouldn't have had to like our, the, this, this library, I've been working on it for, oh, I don't know, eight years or something, seven or eight years. And it's just been a long time since it was defined. And, and right now the RxJS ships everything, um, like RxJS ships everything and I want to have it separate. But like the real point is you shouldn't have to, because again, there's seven year old, uh, proposal languishing, um, this whole talk, like I, I wanted to do it in public space. I wanted to be recorded. I want people to see it because I'd really like people to start shaming the TC 39 for allowing everyone to reinvent observable over and over and over again and ship observable. Like, yeah, I don't even know how many bytes over the, the wire, like over and over instead of just having it built into 
platforms. Um, and, you know, meanwhile, we're getting like whatever weird ass APIs that they, they keep proposing. Like there's this really horrible pipeline operator and stuff. It's bad. Um, anyway, so our CS8, uh, which is currently under development, we switch over to work on that primarily, um, is going to ship, uh, we want to ship just an observable package. So it'll be like at Arx observable or something like that, where you can import and just use the observable itself. If you want to write a library and you don't want all the operators, because it makes some people more comfortable to do that for whatever reason, maybe they don't want their teams to have access to operators because they shoot themselves in the foot too often with them. That's fine. Um, the regular RxJS library will still exist. It's just going to import and re-export from these other, these other, uh, modules. So. That's, that's one thing we're looking at doing here. Uh, first, first part of this year, um, it's low going, we're it's a volunteer, volunteer workforce, but, uh, but yeah, that's the plan is to try to get a standalone version of observable out there. Uh, that's the ArcGIS observable and hopefully try to get some more people to standardize on it. So we can quit shipping multiple versions of the same thing around in everybody's bundles. Um, all right. So our previous problem that we looked at before, what would that look like in a world where observables were native, right? In a world where observables were native, you might have to implement your own pipe function because you wouldn't have like pipe method on that. But there's an actual proposal in the, in the Wetwig that I was asked to put there by the Chrome team and it didn't make it anywhere. A Chrome team was interested, nobody else was, uh, to put observables on event targets. So there would be like this, uh, this on thing. So you in react to be like, okay, so I'm getting a reference to an input element and you can say on input and you would get an observable of events, right? So that you could subscribe to. So you could therefore go through and pipe them through operators that maybe you wrote yourself, or maybe you imported from a library like RxJS. And if it were native, there'd really no, there wouldn't be a reason that, uh, either somebody would publish a library or react themselves wouldn't publish a library that to use observable values from observables, or if, if they don't even support it directly somehow uh, in their JSX templating. Um, so it would probably look more like this in a world where we actually had these things. Uh, if we had a good pipeline operator, it might even look like this, but unfortunately the proposal that's made it to stage two now is an absolutely crappy pipeline operator that you could do with let and a variable. Um, it's super weird, go look it up. Uh, feel free to, to rage against that proposal because it's so bad. Um, all right. So, yeah, I mean, some more examples. It still has the pipeline operator into it. We can talk about that afterwards if you like, but, uh, basically what I want people to take away from all this is one, the most important thing, async is never as simple as it looks. Never, ever. If you have asynchronous code and it looks simple, you're missing something. If like after your await, you aren't checking to see if it's been canceled and then returning or something, you probably should. I think like a, a smoke test I use when I look at people's async code, if they're, if they're using async await, um, consider your cancellation paths, consider what your error paths, uh, you, you need to understand your async primitives, like when they fire, how they fire, like, like how they work. I encourage everybody to explore observable. I know that uh, everyone in this Angular call probably has explored observable or used them extensively. Um, and just keep an eye out for the standalone version of ArcGIS is observable, which we want to get out this year. Uh, and then other than that, get active in TC39 issues because uh, they're operating without many eyes. They, they kind of, I feel like they do things somewhat, they, they say they do it in the open, but a lot of it's back channel. And a lot of it is just like, they'll, they'll sneak out like, oh, by the way, we're using the hack pipeline operator because everyone uses the hack language, right? Like the, the bespoke language, the PHP dialect that Facebook invented, um, <laughs> which I don't even understand. Okay. I'm going to get involved in these things so you can keep an eye and make suggestions and show support for things that you approve of. They are doing some really good things with CC39. They're also doing some really weird stuff. Uh, they need more public involvement, honestly. Uh, that's it. That's the whole talk. Hopefully. 
hopefully everybody got the, the correct takeaway. I was laughing that. a couple of times. It was pretty good. And it was, uh, there were some points when it was similar to a talk that Sandra and I did a while back, but we had, uh, you, you went into a lot more detail than we did, but I liked it. Okay. Uh, let's see if anybody has questions. Anybody? We have, Ben, do you have time for questions? We're at the top of the hour. How are you doing? All right. Uh, yeah, anybody yeah, have yeah. questions for Ben? I did. Going once, going twice. Okay, I can go ahead and, what's that, Sander? I said no one has any questions that is special. <laughs> it has to, no, it has to soak in our brain for a minute. I put um, the mother seat. Yeah, I, I. Well, I know Nat Natalia here and no questions. I have I'm a not sure what's going on there. Um, I guess with the uh, RxJS 8, and um, I guess you're talking about observables, standalone observables without the operators. Um, is there anywhere we can take a look at uh, good examples of mm -hmm. how that might be used? Uh, It completely froze them up. <laughs> it was a really good question. Froze. Um, Sorry, Ben, you froze. Can you back up a second? Yeah, yeah. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes, we can. Yeah, help. you were just frozen right, so, for a second. Yeah, it was, it was crazy on my screen. Like half of you went into network problems and then the other half was fine. Um, anyway. Uh, so, yeah, so the, the packages aren't split off yet. That's the next bit of work to do. The other thing that's happening in version eight is we're, we're removing all the long deprecated. There's a, APIs have been deprecated for like six or seven years and we're finally removing those things. So, um, yeah, once that work is done, we're going to split it up into different packages. There's some debate about how we're going to split the packages up, right? Like, um, for example, like, do we put all the operators in one package or do we split the operators into different packages there's debates about that uh feel free to hop on and make suggestions in the in the uh, repository um and then there's other things like uh you know standalone observable we'll probably keep the pipe method on there because it's so integral to how rxs works uh and it's useful for other folks probably too um but uh you know like is there any RxJS specific things that we want to pull off of there? Um, so there, there's there's some things there's some things that are need to be settled, and they'll be settled during the alpha and beta stages of of version eight, and then uh, we'll get it out. So the only thing I can tell you is that I would encourage you to uh, keep an eye on like I usually tweet the stuff or keep an eye on the the repository and. Um, you know, as you see new alpha and beta versions of RxJS come out, try them and play with them. I'm putting Ben's Twitter oh. handle in the chat. It's easy. It's Ben Lush. Easy to yeah, spell, I easy know. to remember. Yeah, I follow Ben on, on Twitter. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot, Ben. That That's good. Yeah, um, yeah cause I, I think I, I've gone into the source code a few times, um, RxJS and start to look and try to understand things. and. Yeah, I think that would be an interesting approach, uh, being uh, able to separate the observable and the operators. And I'm looking forward to it. So, so I mean, just just high level, like the way that it would work is you'd just import observable from that package and use it the same way that you would if you imported it from RxJS, right? Like it's not going to be massively different. Um, there's other, you know, another thing that we like need to consider is like, what would we do with uh, subjects, for example, like, do we put them all in one package or does each subject get its own package? And because if you have the replay subject package, it's going to depend on the subject package. And then do you ship them both out of there? Like, you know, there's this weird, there's some weird stuff we need to decide uh, about that. So it's always a slippery slope. Yeah. Rob? Agent RR. Hi, hi Ben. Yeah, I have uh, two questions. One is, can you show us a sample of the uh, async await cancellation? Uh, so you said. I don't know if he has time. Oh, I think if we get if we get him started live coding, that could be like a whole. Ben, it's really fun <laughs> when you hang out with us and just like randomly live code stuff. 
But I also know you have a stand-up coming up. Yeah, I already told, and now I already he's told like, him I wasn't going to make it. I, I yeah, already told him. Oh! It's, uh, it's oh. Uh, this particular pot I didn't have anything for today. So, oh. let's see. Right. I got something. Well, uh, should I stop the recording? Maybe I should leave the recording going because sometimes we stop the recording and we miss magical stuff. All right. Well, we'll leave I it mean, going. So, let's and just other, say that. The other question that I have been is, is one that we had always a discussion about uh, unsubscribing from the observables and what is your yeah. what's your opinion on that what is your take i mean because should you always unsubscribe right and can you make that um, bigger yeah can i make i can make this bigger should you always unsubscribe i mean you should always unsubscribe from observables if you aren't sure when they're going to end right um, so like one, one that I think is kind of interesting or funny is every now and then, and I'll just, I don't even know, like every now and then I'll see something where someone will have some component. They'll be like this on mouse down equal like in react or something, they'll come in here and then they'll have like, I don't know, whenever they, whenever they do this, they want to do like, you know, mouse moves, you know, pipe to until uh, let's see events right. so let's just say that this is from event document mouse moves this is from event document mouse up and you've got this you're using this for some sort of drag thing all right in what world are you not going to put your mouse up at some point <laughs> right like i mean maybe you need this to be mouse up and uh document mouse out or something also in case you like go off the screen and put your mouse up but at like the end of the day if if i were to do all this and then subscribe to it inside of here like yeah, yeah i probably don't need to track that subscription because i can roughly guarantee you i'm not going to hold my finger on my mouse key forever like it's just not a thing so like yeah I guess use your use your best judgment. But like if you're if you've got a totally synchronous iterable like of high and you subscribe to it, by the time I'm in the next line, you know I've I've seen I've seen this before. People do this subscription, and then next line they're like, I need to unsubscribe from this. But like by the time it gets here, it's already unsubscribed. Like it's done because this was totally synchronous. So. You know, use common sense, like think about, like understand what it's doing. Is it going to hurt anything to do this? No. Like when in doubt, unsubscribe, right? Like if you don't know, unsubscribe. It's like you definitely should default to that. Um, but there are cases where, you know, unsubscribing isn't the most important thing in the world. It's probably not going to hurt anything, right? Like even even if you just think if it's like the single value case, like say you've got your, what's in, in Angular, you'd be like HTTP, at uh whatever and you subscribe right if, if you're doing that i don't know how long it's gonna take but i can tell you it's only gonna be one value so if if you don't unsubscribe from this it's the same thing as like fetch whatever then right you're, you're this you're not unsubscribing from this you're not unsubscribing from nobody looks at this and says oh it's the end of the world um is it great no it's not great but it's not gonna we're not gonna be the the defining performance difference in your app either um same thing here right so i mean again use your best judgment just understand how things work so promise cancellation just really quick we talked about that if i got a promise and need i need something to wait so let's just do function sleep this should be built into language too. How many times I've had to write this dumbass thing? Let's see. Why isn't this auto completing? All right. So, our sleep function, we're going to go up here and we'll await it. Um, you know, let's wait. Sleep. Uh, five seconds. Now it's too long. Three seconds. And then we'll come down here and we'll all right so 
Let's see. Natty, you should raise your All right, hand. So we have need a list to do. Sorry, go ahead, Ben. Right, so here we got await whatever, and then I'll console log it, and this is not canceled. Let's see. three seconds and then it says hi now what we want is we want the ability to cancel this sucker somehow and so how do we go about doing that well what if i passed in an abort signal or something like that right so this is this is one way is to have an abort signal and this now takes a signal and it's complaining because i haven't given it one that means i have to get an abort controller and I need to get uh, the signal off it, pass it in. So pass in here. Now, I need something to trigger that, that I can control it'll happen before three seconds occurs. And the other thing I need to do is just be like right here and be like, if now I could pass the cancellation all the way into here if I wanted to, right? And I would get a set timeout and I would have to do something to reject this promise and everything. Instead, I'm just going to go here. I'm lazy and I'm just going to say if uh, signal dot aborted and return, right? So now it's not going to, there's going to be nothing here instead of high if I, if I abort it. And so to abort this, I'm just going to add in like a click or something. Now it's we'll wait first and it's going to go and three seconds and it says hi if I refresh and before three seconds I click there get undefined so that's not really cancellation because you can't cancel a promise it's like more like disinterest right like I'm no longer interested in whatever's going to happen here so if I had some big expensive calculation down here you know we skipped it as we stopped here. So it's the best you can do. Um, yeah, so that's that promise cancellation, if you can even call it that. Thank you. Yep. Ben, you have more questions coming in in the chat. I'm trying to get them to raise their hands, but they're a little shy. Uh, but I want you to meet, I don't know if you've met Natalia oh, before, good. but we love Natty. And she always has very good questions. I, I remember, I remember yeah. Natalia. She, she, I definitely remember. She had a lot of questions. I know, we see. love her. Hey, you, good to see you. Thank you. I love you guys too. I'm nice to see you here, Ben. So um, as you were going through the example of the HTTP GET and how Angular gets an observable for that, I've seen plenty of people <clears throat> just turn that into a to promise, observable dot to promise, and just uses the promises instead of the observable. And um, yeah. I was just saying, I don't really mind. I see the logic of that, but would would you keep the observable, or is there really a bad thing turning it into a promise? I mean, they're not like if they're if they're dealing with a promise API, then sure, convert it to a promise. It's fine. If they're not, if they're just doing it to consume it, that's a little weird. Like it's a lot, it's some extra code to call when you could just call subscribe and just ignore the subscription. It'd be the same exact thing. Um, so I don't know. Like, I mean, yeah, if all they're doing, if they're doing it, just subscribe to it because they have some weird objection to not using promises. That's odd. If they're doing it because they want to use it with the sync await or some promise based API, then Great, fine. That's that's fine. Um, yeah, I've got no problems with it. Uh, observable. The only complexity around observable right now is it's not built into the language. If it were built into language, it would be seen as a more primitive asynchronous type than promise because it this doesn't have all this other, uh, you know, it doesn't have like immediate scheduling. It's not greedy. It's not like forced scheduling. Like. There, it, there's just fewer complications around it and what it can do. It doesn't have the, the whole, um, you know, promise unwrapping or auto wrapping features built into it. So that's what I was wondering next, as you were talking about the TC39 observable proposal, I've seen it around before and it's yeah. always brought up 
somehow in the Angular Nation conversations by Sander. Um, but the thing is that I wouldn't know how to help get it approved or get it moving. I just know it's there and it's sitting and I like the GitHub issues that are talking about it. But is there really anything else that we can do? Like what are the action items? I mean, you can, you can uh, continue to file issues and be like, Hey, we still need this. We still want this, like just keep the repository active. Um, because those are, those repositories are still monitored by members of the T39, even if they're relatively inactive. Uh, you can also reach out to people like little Dan. He's a really good guy. Uh, he's, he lives there in Europe. Uh, he's on the T39, really smart guy, really nice guy. Um, it's at little Dan. Um, and Dan is, he's somebody that if you're like, Hey, I was wondering about this proposal. I, I believe that JavaScript needs it and whatever. He'll talk to you about it. He'll remember it. He'll bring it up at the TC 39. Um, the, the biggest thing is that it needs a champion and that that champion probably should be someone that's a member or, um, belongs to a company that is a member company because of how, uh, these these uh committees work and and just the ecma and all that okay so not much i can do <clears throat> i don't know maybe angular nation can bring one no of there's i mean talk and we can harass them into doing it you, you can you can you can write about it like publicly you can post about it on twitter or like you can add uh issues to that to the repository and say, Hey, we still need this. I believe it, but we still need this. And here's, here's why. Um, and you know, try to push on it. Uh, you can, we can invite can, little Dan uh, to come and reach out, hang out with us. You know. yeah, yeah, you should. He's a wonderful yeah. guy. He really is. So if you want someone to tell you all about what's going on in the CC 39 right now, and some of the challenges they have, um, he's a super reasonable, super, very, just absolutely wonderful guy. I like him a lot. Uh, and that's saying something because I have some severe objections to, to the TC39 and how it's run. But but I really do like Dan, and he's he'd be great to get on your show if if you do reach out to him, tell him that tell him that Ben sent sent you because he's he's good. Thank you. We will. All right, I'll try to make that happen, Natty. And I'm sure Sonder will be there for the conversation. Oh okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, Ken has a question. Great question as always, Natty. Uh, hello, Ben. Hello, everyone. Um, I have uh, actually two questions. Uh, the first one is that uh, is your your article uh, I put in the chat still relevant in in twenty twenty three? And uh, the second one, second one is that um, um, under the hood, is there any subtle difference when we call unsubscribe uh, versus when we use the second view operator? All right, so don't, don't unsubscribe article. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if I unpublish that article. All right, so the, the don't unsubscribe <laughs> article is still relevant. Um, yeah, it's still, it's still relevant. All right, so the interesting thing about, um, how do I put this? There's a couple, there's a couple interesting things about this. One is that, here, I, I'm going to, Share my screen again. Here we go. Hold on. Share a tab. All right. So we're going to go back. I'm going to erase this example. I'm sorry, everybody. All right. So let's just say I've got some. Let's install this. Let's say I've got some observable. Let's see. What do I want? Observable, observable, I don't know, timer. And we'll get taken until in there. All right. So here's my timer. We got this durable. Last second. And then when we subscribe to the source. Uh, all right. So if I'm here and I've got this going, the thing I want you to know, notice is in order to get my unsubs, uh, my subscription, I have to wait until after, after I subscribe, right? Now, 
a lot of there's a there's a lot of interesting things about this like if I was to live in a world where instead of doing this, I could pass something else here, like a signal or something like that, um, that makes things easier because then I get the handle to this before I have this. And, and if you have the, if you have the handle for unsubscription before you actually do subscribe, um, and you give it to it as like a token or whatever then you actually end up with more control over it. And it sounds weird to say that, but the reason you have more control is you have that control before this happens. Now, take until is, is kind of a, a poor man's, uh, or, uh, a, or depending on how you look at it, it's a, it's a either poor man's, uh, uh, abort signal sort of thing, or a, maybe even a more robust way to do the same thing. But if you have taken till I can have some other thing, like, like right here, I could be like, oh, well here I would have to do like document. Uh, let's see, document at event listener, click unsubscribe that way. If I wanted to, to do a click unsubscribe. So that's one thing. Or I could come in here and be like, all right, so pipe, uh, take until clicks and I come up here and do this. Now in this case, let me get rid of this one really quick. We'll see. We don't have this, you notice I've got before that, right? And you can even do things like you can compose multiple things. You could compose clicks and, you know, mouse movement or whatever into a single observable and kind of like control that way. So in that regard, it's a little bit more robust, right? Now, the only thing that's not super robust about this as opposed to, as opposed to like uh, your classic abort signal or, or, or token is that if you have an abort signal, If you have an abort signal, it's got this boolean you can check aborted, right? So you can synchronously be like, oh, this is already aborted, forget it. Where like, if I click this before I subscribe, you don't know that I clicked it before I subscribe unless you compose in some other like, you know, sharing with the behavior subject or something like that, where you go in here and you're like, all right, share. And uh, you have to change your connector. Oh, I didn't pull it in. On Staplitz, do your thing. I love Staplitz, by the way. Um, we love Staplitz too. Not a behavior, so I guess a replay subject of one. Right. So in this case, like in order to know that I've already done this once, I would have to have that there before I scribed, right? So it's it's not the best. All right. So back to your question, should you do this instead of unsubscription? Here's what I have to say. It's the difference between this and uh, the other one. The difference between these two statements should be obvious. This one is an observable you'd call a method on. This is observable that you called a method on and you passed another observable to a function that you're calling methods on that observable and then returning new observable that you're calling a method on. So guess which one of those is a lot more work, right? Like this one's more CPU power, but it does give you more control because I could have, uh, you know, I could say take until stops and then stops could be like, Uh, you know, merge of whatever clicks and some other thing. Like you could bring a timer in. I want to stop it after four seconds or something like that, right? Like way more control. So which one is better? Mm, debatable, right? Like it's not like 
this is more compositional, gives you more control, gives you the ability to define your, your unsubscription notifier ahead of time. Um, this one here, way less code executed, uh, less to ship to the browser, like you're not shipping take until and replay subject and a bunch of other stuff, depending on what you wanted to do. Um, you don't have to do this by the way, obviously it's, I'm just sting that is like if i want to know i if i click something in advance um like which one's better mm, i tend to just go for this one most of the time until i until things get really complicated with a lot of different observables in which case tech until is a very powerful tool um take until by the way also pairs very really well with like take until repeat or something like that if you wanted to like set up your observable again uh after a notification but um ben, yeah can i can i add something there because i get yeah. this question a lot also and um i was about to say if we don't hear from sonder we're gonna have to because we talk about this a lot in the friday social a lot sorry sonder <laughs> i was gonna make yeah you, you know that i have done a couple of if you didn't yeah well, Ben, I think you know I have a couple of rounds of utilities for unsubscribing it for Angular. Um, I come to the conclusion yeah. that uh, it is not worth my time doing all of those times. And whenever I do a subscribe, I say, hey, there must be an unsubscribe stored somewhere and called. And not because there are no uh, other technical options, but because it doesn't take me one second of thinking. So the reason I say always unsubscribe right. is not for a technical reason, but more like, okay, if you see a subscribe, there should be an unsubscribe, so you're not leaking, period. And we're also and, getting and a lot is... of questions from beginners yeah. in the Friday social yeah, yeah. because people come and go and we have the same people come or the new people come in and asking questions, you know how it is. So these are also questions that are like good for everyone. <laughs> so I think, but I do think it's good hygiene especially for beginners or right, for people yeah, yeah. who are learning RxJS to just unsubscribe. I mean, think? yeah, I mean, you can do this thing too, where you just make a like parent subscription. Like that's a, that's a really common thing I'll do where I'm just like, all right, so you have some main subscription and you just add these, right? Like, and then at the end you just for each, Unsubscribe? No, you do unsubscribe to the main. No, you know how to do that. Like you, you just yeah. So you can do this. Uh, if you add subscriptions to the main subscription, this is all. This is engineered too, by the way. That if any one of these unsubscribes before this, it'll it'll remove itself. It cleans itself up from the main subscription. But if later on, when I say main subscription unsubscribe, it will unsubscribe both of these, right? So it's like you can you can build one subscription to rule them all and then so you can in your component have one subscription and then just look and everywhere you subscribe be like did i add it to the, my main subscription okay well and this the solution works great for instances where you set up a bunch of observables and you only really care about unsubscribing to them once from them once like in your end on destroy or your component on mount or whatever um that's that's where this works well where this works well is in situations where there's multiple different things that might cause you to want to unsubscribe from a uh, from the, like this example here, where I've got a timer and clicks and probably you know your your uh, teardown. But even in your teardown case, you probably still cover it this way. Like you know, th this is this is almost more for like user interactions that are going to cause something to tear down, but. Um, that maybe you look at this and the more, most important thing is, is it maintainable? Like if you have a situation where you're like, oh, well, I've got clicks or timers or a tear, main teardown that can tear this down. And that's too confusing for you. Well, okay, great. Maybe you need to move to a situation where everything's going through take until or something. Like the important thing is that you can maintain it and that it's not confusing to you. So, um, yeah. Yeah. It, it, but this is the, the thing is it doesn't only need to be not confusing to you, but it must also be not confusing to the rest of your team. Right. And, and that is something that um, I take this for granted sometimes and I build code and then I have to explain it to someone and I think, oh crap, I should have just 
put like an unsubscriber there and so i don't have this discussion at all this would be a great one josiah if you're yeah, uh yeah. if you get a chance right, maybe I you can do. break this down into one little video and then we can just refer to it for any time the subject comes up we don't have to explain it over and over again you're like listen we talked to ben lesh about this and here's what he said <laughs> all right i do have a hard stop now so i have an, another meeting to go to then this is the next okay. one i cannot miss so okay uh, I want you to say hi real quick to Akila because she's the one who was supposed to be there in London and she was excited to meet you. Uh, oh. But we ran. Hi, Akila. Akila, you had a question, but also. Yeah. yeah, but if Ben needs to go, uh, Sondra can also take over questions. No, hit, the Friday hit it. Hit it. I'll tell my coworkers. Yeah, it's, to, to <laughs> it's, not, it's not too complicated. Uh, all, people, but... um, really, it's just, you know, when you're learning. And I know it's, it's something that you do over time, but are there techniques that you can use to become more aware of what you expect when you subscribe to things? I guess. I love the tap. Oh, let's see. Do you use the tap? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. So tap, tap, especially now, tap has um, a lot more powerful features because you can like, there's an event for when, when you subscribe, there's an event for when you unsubscribe specifically, not just when it completes, right? Um, so like to, and there's actually an event for finally as well. Like they'll always fire. So like there's a tap has a lot more tools than it used to for like getting some introspection and in what's happening. Um, you know, as far as what to expect, like that's a, that's a broad question, but like when to expect it, tap is a great tool to know that, like to know what happened when, like you can get in and, and you know when it's subscribed, you know when it unsubscribed, you know what events you got, like all oh, that's a great introspection tool. What to expect, I mean, realistically, uh, it's sort of like a promise in that you would have to know what the underlying implementation was. Like if I just hand you an observable and say, subscribe to this, and you wanted to know, like, is it gonna set up a website or read from a file? Like the only way to know that is to see the implementation of what it's gonna do, right? But you could at the very least know when it's doing it. Like that's definitely something you can get an introspection on. Such good questions. Okay, real quick before you go, we have a uh, we have a tradition here at Angular Nation. Everybody help me out. This is where we all come off mute and thank Ben for his time. We love you, Ben. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, ben. Thank you. You're all very welcome. Thank you, Ben.